Great. Um, so I wanted to uh, start by just going briefly over our agenda for today's session. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists. I don't think Anajat has joined us yet. Um, so right now we have um, three panelists that will be joining us today. Um, we're going to have um, some presentations by each, and then we'll uh, open it up to all of you if you have any questions. Um, we plan to have a breakout session um, just to have some discussion around some of the topics that are being presented by the panelists, and then um, just have some time at the end um, for any final comments and just kind of to wrap up the session. But I am very excited um, to welcome our panelists for today's session. Um, Joel Nita is at the University of Tokyo. Um, he is a carpentries instructor and active member in the Japan community. His research is on the ecology and evolution of ferns. He has a lovely fern pictured behind him right now. Um, <laughs> Liz Stokes is a senior research data skills specialist in the ARDC skilled workforce program, um, which supports key communities and national infrastructure for, di for digital research skills training. She is a ResBAS champion and coordinator of the ARDC's Carpentries Partnership. With um, twin passions of skills sharing and community building, Liz also leads an ARDC community facilitators group and supports the Australasian DMP's interest group. And then um, Dr. Nisha Gatak, who actually wasn't able to join us today, but she did um, provide us with a video, um, is the Research Communities Advisor and Training Lead at New Zealand eScience Infrastructure, or NESI. Um, her role focuses on growing the e-research capabilities in New Zealand through training, delivery, and community building. Um, as a regional coordinator for the Carpentries in New Zealand, uh, she works towards champion Carpentries training efforts in the New Zealand community, and as the community engagement remains one of the most favorite parts of her work. Um, so as I mentioned, Nisha was not able to be here with us today because um, she actually had a graduation um, that was canceled due to COVID and it got rescheduled <laughs> at this exact time. So <laughs> she wasn't able to be here, um, but I am going to share a video that um, she made um, for us to, to show today. And then um, Murray uh, Kadzow, um, did I get it right, Murray? Perfect. <laughs> Murray Katzell is with us and he will be available to answer any questions that come up about the new um, Zealand community during our discussion. Um, but we've asked the panelists today to kind of present an overview of the Carpentries activities that they currently have ongoing at their organization or within their region, um, some projects that their regional subcommunities might be working on um, and any challenges they may be experiencing in their um, community as it relates to the work that they're doing for the Carpentries. Um, so to get us started, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here for a minute. I'm gonna play um, the video that Nisha shared with us and let us hope that it works. <laughs> Give me a thumbs up if you hear sound. I have to put in my password real quick. It's not wanting to play. Give me just one second. I continue to have technical difficulties <laughs> with playing videos for some reason. Every now and then it works and then other times it doesn't. I'm gonna try one more time for this. And if not, I might try to stream it through. I don't know why it's not playing. I have a backup plan. Give me just one second. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. <laughs> Let's see here. I'm gonna try to play it directly through. Chrome and see if this works. OK, 
Can anyone hear anything? Of course not. Hmm. In the Maybe. sound settings at the top, turn the original sound on for the video, and then you should be able to hear it. I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, you know, at the top of the screen next to the recording, like in the top left corner, on the Zoom screen. Yeah. It says original sound off, right? Um, it doesn't say anything. Oh, okay. So on mine, it says next to the recording, it says original sound off. If that's on, we can hear the video. Okay. I might or say- also yeah, in the share sound, uh, in the bottom left corner of the share selection window, sometimes there's a share sound button, if that works as well. Yeah, I'm I'm doing the same thing I've done every time I've played a video over the past several days. And again, oh. sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, see if someone else has any luck um, getting this to play um, through their computer. I'm going to share um, the URL into the chat and see um, if someone with sharing capabilities, maybe Murray, do you want to see if you can play it through your computer? It might just be an issue with mine specifically. Uh, I'll give it a go, but I normally have issues with audio as well. Let's see. One moment. Let's try that. Kia ora koutou, haere mai. This is Nisha. Uh, I'm the Carpentries Community Coordinator for Aotearoa New Zealand. Uh, my role focuses on um, championing carpentry's training efforts amongst uh, those in the New Zealand community. Um, so just going through some of the things that um, this panel might discuss um, in the session. Uh, one of the projects that we're working on um, at uh, uh, NESI as a national organization is uh, as members of the carpentry's community is to recognize the gaps in knowledge within the community as a result of some of the recent changes in structure of the carpentries. Um, so we want to reach out to trainers in the community to know what their thoughts are uh, on the pain points of the moment and what might be holding them back and um, from doing a, a centrally organized workshop, for example, and um, what they might find uh, or what they might be finding easy. Uh, while navigating uh, um, the organization around a self-organized workshop. So um, we did have a community call and we did discuss some of these details and we hope to extend this discussion further in the later months. Um, one of the issues that we are currently facing is with access to AME database and as a national organization, having that holistic picture of areas of excellence and where we can contribute is uh, extremely crucial. So um, that's definitely been a challenge. Uh, we're also um, very actively trying to understand where institutional memberships might not be able to provide the support um, that trainers need, uh, and also recognizing areas with lower interest in um, uh, carpentry training. By areas, I mean uh, geographical areas and institutional areas. Uh, this is where uh, NESI helps out nationally to support uh, trainers who may face infrastructural challenges. Um, this is especially true for uh, instructor training sessions, and um, we have sent out an expression of interest for those who may be keen on coming on board for one of the future sessions. Uh, we have one coming up in late October and um, early next year, so uh, please keep an eye out and go to the NESI website if you're keen to uh, come on board and be an instructor trainer um, uh, or attend one of the instructor training sessions to become a trainer. Uh, if you are in New Zealand and are interested to be a trainer, uh, please reach out to um, us through training at Nessie um, and we can guide you further. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments around um, the activities uh, in the community, um, uh, in the New Zealand community, um, I think Murray might be in the audience for this session. Uh, please reach out to Murray 
and he's he's the expert who can guide you through this in my absence and um um also feel free to pass on your questions to alicia who can um get who can get them to me and i can get back to you via email um please have a wonderful session and thank you Thanks so much, Nisha, remotely. And Murray, thank you so much for getting that video up and running for us. I have been really struggling with these videos <laughs> this week. Um, who knows if they're going to play or if they're not going to play. So um, thanks for stepping in and, and playing that for us. Um, I know Nisha put that time together um, and wanted to be sure we, we were able to hear from her. Um, but uh, I'm going to um, pass it over um, to you, Joel, to, to go next. So uh, yeah, today I'm going to be uh, introducing the software carpentry uh, in Japan uh, community. Um, so as a overview, uh, this is a map of carpentry's activities, well, number of workshops uh, hosted by the carpentries um, in their annual report, uh, the most recent one. And as you can see, uh, the number of workshops in the Asia generally is is very very low compared to the rest of the world, um, and there's only one dot in Japan, and it actually only represents two workshops. So uh, we are just getting started in, in Asia and in Japan. Um, and another thing that I want to just bring up as uh, some background information is that uh, Japan is, is well known as a very as a technological innovator and a you know very high tech sort of country, but um, the uh, there's some um issues with diversity so if we look at per, the number of women researchers as a percentage of total researchers this is data from oecd countries japan is at the bottom it's not good and so um there are various organizations and efforts that are, are trying to change this um, and I think that the car um, could also have a really positive impact because of the, um, the of the carpentries and, and what it's trying to do. So that's just some some background information. Um, so uh, if we and looking at the start of of carpentries activities in Japan, uh, that started around 2018, um, and at the time there had only been one workshop held uh, in English um not in Japanese uh there is zero lessons zero content available in Japanese and zero member organizations so it was basically nothing um not not to say that the one workshop wasn't uh, an important contribution I don't want to uh give that impression um but there were no long-term um community activities uh going on so um the beginnings of of our current community um, started with Tom Kelly, uh, who's a, a software carpentries instructor or carpentry instructor actually from New Zealand. So some of you uh, New Zealand folks might know him, um, presented uh, at the R meetup, uh, Tokyo R meetup. And he also um, announced it on Twitter and, and started trying to build this, this community. Um, and uh, Tom kind of put translation uh, as a central focus of the group from from the beginning. So um, the activities of our community, uh, I would say, are really involved two major areas, and that is translation, and then also trying to grow the carpentries in Japan, because, as I said, it was, there was essentially no long term um, activities before this. Uh, so that includes both outreach and then running workshops. So um, some of these slides are also I presented during the translation panel, um, but for translation, we're using a system designed by uh, David uh, Perez Suarez. Um, and this is uh, a system that is also being used for several other languages. Um, and there's different ways to, to do it or to implement it, but we um, review the translations and do everything on GitHub. Uh, so using their PR review tools, um, which is ha, has been a handy way to do things if you know how to use Git. Um, since we started our translation activities, uh, we completed the R novice Gapminder uh, lesson, 
And uh, we are, are working on Git novice and shell novice. So these are all lessons from the software cart. Um, so just to summarize this little section on translation, I would say some of the green stickies, the good points are that GitHub works well for collaboration because that's what it's designed to do. Uh, and it's nice that you can do translation review in the browser. You don't have to install anything or run anything locally. Um, some pain points, the, the red stickies are, first of all, that requirement for Git knowledge to do this is a very high barrier to participation. So that has limited the number of people who can, can participate. And sort of as a, a corollary, that leads to burnout because only a few members can contribute. So unfortunately, we haven't been as active as I would like uh, in the past several months. Um, but hopefully that is going to change in the future um, with the upcoming workbench format, which you may have heard of. It's the new format for Carpentry's lessons. Uh, and I'm currently working on an R package to facilitate translation with that that will hopefully make things easier and break down some of these barriers. And you can find more information about that uh, at the slides here. Um, and actually, I remembered I meant to put a link to my slides that I'm presenting right now in the chat. So I'll go ahead and whoops, do that if I can click on this. Um, just a second. Chat, chat, chat. That reminded me. Okay, so that's a, a link to uh, the slides that I'm showing right now. So you can, if you go there, you can click on these links that I have in the slides. Okay, so some of our other activities um, would include outreach. And outreach is really important because, uh, as I've said several times now, Carpentries is, is only just getting started in Japan. So that involves members promoting the carpentries at their respective institutions. And we try to present the carpentries and increase awareness at meetings and uh, like, for example, lab meetings or, or meetups uh, whenever possible. Um, recently, we were able to use our translated materials of the R lesson to have our first workshop in Japanese at the University of Tokyo in 2019. Um, and that was in collaboration with a organization at the University of Tokyo called Beyond AI. And it was really important to have that sort of institutional side support and um, organization that we could collaborate with to make this happen. Uh, I found that to be crucial to the success of this workshop. Um, for communications and collaboration, we mostly use uh, Slack. So uh, this workshop, uh, this Slack workspace. Um, Although I'm sure many of you, many of you have may, may have heard uh, that Slack is changing its policies and that the free uh, workspaces are um, going to have limited access to content older than 90 days. Well, you can't see content older than 90 days starting September 1st. So we need to come up with a solution to that. Um, and we haven't done so yet. Um, so we mostly communicate via Slack. We also have meetings on Zoom um, every few months. Um, and one thing uh, that our organization is completely grassroots and um, kind of organically uh, assembled. So we never really had any formal roles uh, decided, which I don't think is necessarily a good thing. And we would like to change that going forward, but uh, we're a really small group and for better or worse, uh, we've been able to do things this way so far. And this is our, our webpage. I encourage you to check it out if you're interested. So the current status as to com com compare it to 2018, we now have approximately 30 members. At least that's how many people we have on Slack. Uh, I would say like the quote unquote core members or people who are, are quite active is probably around six to eight, something like that. Uh, we have one lesson fully translated. We had one workshop held in Japanese and we still have zero member organizations. So uh, getting a foothold and getting the carpentries really established in Japan ha has continued to be difficult. Um, so some sort of key uh, points, take home messages. One is that I think translation of the content is a prerequisite to growing the carpentries in an in a area where English is not the primary language. Um, so, that's a really, as you've seen from my slides, that's a really important part of our activities. Um, and 
we need that in place in order to further build the carpentries here. Um, online participation has been really important for uh, making work, making that workshop possible for one and just our activities in general. We pretty much got started just before the pandemic and then all our activities have been during the pandemic. So everything we do has been online. The workshop was held online. Um, we had instructors teaching in Japanese, but who, who were located like in the United States or in Australia and, and helpers in different countries. And since our member, our community is so small, uh, it's very hard to expect that we're gonna have people show up locally. Um, so having international participation uh, via online platforms has been really important for us. Um, and then the other thing is that building, <laughs> this is from personal experience, we found that building a carpentry's community from zero is hard. <laughs> it is tough to sell uh, the concept. And I think that part of that may be due to a lack of cultural familiarity. Um, so the carpentries has been, it's really well known now in the US and most, a, a lot of people in the research community have at least heard of it if they don't know maybe exactly what it's doing. Um, but that the sort of concept of um, having workshops and community and, and members of the community helping each other out, that sort of thing is still not very common in Japan. It's the paradigm here is, is more uh, that people will um, study on their own and absorb things on their own time at, in, a, in a more, um, not well, yeah, in a, in a more uh, sort of one-way fashion as opposed to lots and lots of interaction. So there's some cultural difference there that, that make that hard. Um, and it, it's difficult to convince people who have, who have zero familiarity with what the Carpentries does. Um, and the other thing I've noticed is that, again, personal experience, is that community members are not necessarily in a position to establish Carpentries in their local institutions. I try to tell the people who I interact with that the Carpentries is great and that we should do it and that it's a good idea, but I'm pretty low on in, in the rank of things in my institution and I'm not the one calling the shots. So it's, it's what I say carries very little weight unfortunately. Um, so I think ultimately what we need is better outreach at higher levels. Um, it would be fantastic if people at my university could talk to some of the, um, yeah, core members of the Carpentries uh, and, and try to have outreach there um, because there's only much that, that I can do uh, in my current position. Um, so I don't want to end it on a sad note. I'm really excited for every, all the progress that we've made, and I'm sure that things are going to continue to grow, but those have been uh, some of our, the issues that we've dealt with. And I'd love to hear if anybody uh, has, has ideas. Uh, so thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Joel. That was, that was great. And I, I have lots of questions, <laughs> um, but before, um, before that, um, we'll turn it over to Liz for her to present on what is happening um, in Australia. Okay, can you can you see me and can you see some slides? Yeah, we got it. What is what is Zoom doing? Um, that's all good. And maybe I can just come over here and make that big. All right. So um, what I'm going to do is essentially I'm going to reuse, reach into the are of the FAIR principles and reuse a presentation that I gave about a month ago um, to the education um, and training in the handling of research data um, uh, interest group of the Research Data Alliance. Um, but I'm going to, I've moved it a little bit so that it focuses on, um, it can give the, um, our, our group here today some background on the ARDC partnership um, and how we have been growing the Australian Carpentries communities, um, how it works and our motivations for that. Um, I'd like to also share my opinion that open educational resources are great, but people need to know how to use them. And that's actually, that's the main thing that I've learned through becoming a trainer in the Carpentries. 
and also underscore the importance of providing administrative support and trainer expertise into putting exemplar materials to good use, okay? So, and maybe some of this will be really interesting um, uh, for, for you, Joel. So uh, as customary, I'd like to acknowledge that I live on the Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation, uh, and um, these lands are bordered by three rivers, the um, Georges River to the south, um, the Nepean River um, to the um, west and up to the Hawkesbury River um, to the north. Um, Aboriginal sovereignty has not been ceded in this country uh, and I pay my respects to the custodians of land and knowledge that are held, held in this land here. So my first thing I'd like to address is what is the problem that we are trying to solve? And um, I, I like ideas and um, they help me um, keep going. So for my position, I work for the Australian Research Data Commons uh, in the skilled workforce team. So increasingly, we all know that um, we need to recognise data and software skills um, uh, as we generate more and more data. And I think this U Rubik's cube, cube is a useful idea to think about. So we talk about how the best skills training is modular, customizable, and fair. And the Carpentries curriculum represents this um, in, in spades. And however, without that sk skilled expertise to deliver the training, it's useless. It's a bit like data. So the point of my talk is to shift the away the attention away from solving the Rubik's cube in front of us of resource development and actually how the hands are working uh, to solve the Rubik's cube. So what are people doing to um, enable the Rubik's cube solving? Um, before I get too far into it, I'd like to give you a little picture of the ARDC. Uh, this may be, our organisation may be unfamiliar to you and we're realising what what in fact we are all the time. So these are the other components of the multifaceted Australian Research Data Commons. We're a government investment under the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Scheme in Australia. Now you can see the logo in the bottom right of that slide. My skills and workforce development team sits under the first column on the left, people and policy. I like to say that unless people have the skills to use this infrastructure, that investment is wasted. So one thing that we want to do at ARDC is uplift the Australian e-research and digital, digital skills trainer community. And we've partnered with the Carpentries to offer a big multi-organisational membership to provide instructor training to researchers and the people that support them. Why did we choose the Carpentries? Well, looking at the market landscape for two key drivers in the digital skills training sector, um, looking at open, who's providing open and reproducible methods and who is providing community opportunities or uh, opportunities to build community. And as you can see in this graph, the Carpentries came out on top there. Uh, very close to it uh, is Resbaz, the Research Bazaar Festival that I know Murray is um, well familiar with here on this call, uh, and also Fiona, I think, um, as well. Um, both Resbaz festivals and Carpentries offer networking and collaboration, and they both pay attention to the social nature of learning and doing research. Recently, the uh, Resbaz coordinators in Australia got together and have started to talk about how we can shift the focus a little away from training and more to the networking and um, uh, collaboration side um, of, of community building. Uh, but that's another topic. So I'm gonna stay on topic here and continue. So the reasons that we wanted to start this partnership was because um, individual organisations um, and organisational memberships were not actively growing the community in Australia. Uh, local, we wanted local coordination to renew and grow our trainer community. And we wanted to encourage that collaboration between institutions and broker relationships. So we're, we're using the partnership to do that. Um, I have a... Um, I have a picture there of a motorcycle and um, a, 
a, a human and a dog there. Um, but in this analogy, I would like to like you to imagine that the researcher is the one riding the motorcycle and the support service provider um, could be a golden retriever, actually, if you look really closely. And that's, that's my library joke for today, golden retrievers, um, is in the sidecar with supplementary instruments, you know, moral support and all that. And also like, oh, here's the, here are the standards you should be using. So if these two um, companions are not in agreement of the direction or the road, there'll be problems. Carpentry's instructor training, um, I hold, helps both of these roles develop a shared language and complementary skills. And that's my, uh, I guess that's why I'm in this, because I came in through the library carpentry um, side, side of carpentries and I think it's important that Carpentries is not singularly a researcher focused activity, but there are a, a multiplicity of roles in this space um, uh, who, are, who are all welcome. So a little more on the ARDC partnership. So we have um, uh, 11 other members um, who, uh, and we've taken out a platinum um, membership and then we contract out um, a, a number of instructor seats. So this actually really brings the cost of membership down because our partners are engaging with that, this, with our, our membership, our Carpentries membership, on the basis that they are clearly going to get um, the number of instructor seats that they require for the size and their own uh, local plans. Uh, and it makes it a fairly simple way of managing a membership. So they tell us how many um, seats they want, we invoice them, they pay the invoice, and the instructors um, attend, attend instructor training. Sounds relatively uh, straightforward, um, uh, but as we all know, there are other components to that. To give you a little bit more uh, idea of what's the story behind all of those logos, um, we have the two major training organisations in Australia, that's QCIF up the top and Intersect. And we also have the two major high performance compute centres in Australia also as partners. And that is the PAUSI or CSIRO um, logo there and NCI, um, National Compute Infrastructure, which is um, PAUSI is in um, Western Australia and NCI is based at ANU in Canberra on the other side of the country. And then we have... Um, uh, the remaining institutions are universities. However, new kids on the block um, are the Burnett Institute and the Australian Institute of Marine Science, and they've joined since we launched the partnership at the end of last year. But I'm pleased to say that we've got national coverage across universities, infrastructure and training organisations. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I can go into the wild detail there, but uh, you probably want me to get along um, a bit swifter. So here are the features of this partnership. Um, I'm not going to spend too long on this. We can come, come back to it. But essentially, uh, on the Carpentries website, if you look at the Australian community now and the instructors, there are about 100 people there, but many of them are not active instructors. So this partnership is um, aimed at refreshing that roughly about that 100 number um, with new, new faces. Uh, and then with the, the networks that we've built across the partnership, we are better placed to start offering workshops from 2023. So let me talk about the challenges that have come up here. Uh, and then I can, um, then we can open up for questions. Um, finding a good balance between serving our local needs and participating in the global community um, uh, is tricky. International community is really nice to have, but I don't want it to dominate our training. And one of the challenges that we've had has been having um, people from the US jump into our teaching demonstration sessions and also sign up for our um, instructor training when there are many more opportunities for those um, those to happen in North America than, than the limited space that we have in uh, Australia. Uh, succession planning is also um, an issue for us. We need to, I need to diversify the leadership 
trainer and secretariat roles that I'm currently um, uh, undertaking at once <laughs> or at the moment now. So we, we need a broader and more, more flat structure, I think. Um, collaboration. It's abundantly clear that new member organisations need help to set up the administration and outreach to support their instructors. So here our training organisation members can show institutions how it's done and the um, dresser link that you can see there is a um, dresser.org, um, should be .au actually, it's my, my mistake, my typo, um, can provide a platform for newly minted instructors to find each other and share their resources. So um, DRESA stands for Digital Research um, Skills Australasia, uh, and it's an authenticated network for both Australia and New Zealand um, uh, data skills trainers. Um, and I'm using the word trainer there much more broadly than the, than the carpentry's definition of trainer. And finally, growing the community, seeking strategic partnerships, bringing Australian libraries has been um, together, uh, has been harder than I expected. Um, I think they've been a bit more shy about joining. So my outreach efforts need to go back to the drawing board on that. Uh, however, um, it so far seems to be quite a successful program. Um, we have new partners on board. Um, we have positive feedback from our trainees and the partnership has allowed us to develop relationships with directly with researchers to inform our products and service development at ARDC. Um, so I think like what's really important is that these are the foundational literacies that researchers need if they want access to our infrastructure. So I'm really glad to be in running a program that allows them to access those. And, and that's like that's the really important part of um, message, I think, of um, trying to start up community uh, uh, in, in your local area, that it's not only about you know, what, um, what you can do for the carpentries um, to, uh, but also what else um, that participating in the carpentries can bring to your other areas of influence and activity. I think that's the end of what uh, of my short short ramble. So um, uh, time to move on and other questions. Great, thanks so much, Liz. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think with it just being a small group, we could just kind of open it up um, and have a conversation for the rest of the time that we have today. I had planned on maybe having some breakout groups for us to chat about some things and we could, um, you know, uh, go to some of those questions that we were maybe going to explore during the breakout session. But does anyone have um, any questions? I mean, Murray, I, I should have asked you this question earlier. Did you have anything that you wanted to add to what um, Nisha presented in her presentation? No, I think Nisha's probably got the, the handle on it. Okay, okay, great. Um, well, does anyone, does anyone have any questions um, for, for our um, panelists? Um, feel free to raise your hand or you can type your question into the chat. Um, Fiona. Hi, thanks so much. Thanks for all the presentations. Um, what I'm getting from this is community building is really hard. And I know that I'm one of those inactive um, instructors that Liz is talking about in Australia. And uh, I know for me, um, because this is a volunteer activity above your day-to-day -day job, um, and depending on what your job is at the time, it aligns more or less with it. So I've moved institutions and I've changed jobs recently and carpentry's instruction now um, aligns a lot less with my work than it used to. Um, I guess the question I'm asking is, 
it's always seemed like carpentries is a very grassroots. It starts at the individuals and you build community and it kind of builds up from there. And I'm wondering if there's a need or a way that we can hook into institutions at a more strategic higher level and build down as well. That's it. Anyone yeah. got anything yeah. to say? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, Fiona, I, I totally agree. Um, also, I mean, I should count myself as one of the um, instructors on the on the page of Australian instructors who, you know, are dormant. And because my job is for being a trainer and not not necessarily an instructor. Um, uh, my work really loves to declare that we're not a training organisation, um, but we do want to support um, training organisations. So on the strategic side, I think, I think you're right. Um, it does require a number of different conversations and different initiatives uh, in, in place to um, enable, uh, I guess, organizations to see themselves as future members sorry that was a yes and an agree and not really a solution the solution you are looking for <laughs> I think it relates a lot to what Joel was saying as well um and Joel you had unmuted yourself you should go ahead sure yeah I was just gonna hop in there but um yeah I mean that's exactly like what I and I think I mentioned in the presentation, but that's exactly what we're dealing with right now is how do you make this connection between the grassroots level and the institutional level? Um, and I think, I, don't, I mean, I don't have a good answer. I wish I did. Um, uh, it, it might take to some extent um, just having sort of the right people who can, who are capable of making those uh, decisions and those and affecting those changes, um, becoming aware of the carpentries and, and becoming more involved. I think another thing that we that I struggle with here in Japan is that um, just sort of the way the research community is set up is um, at least at universities is very much lab based and there's not so much um, common infrastructure shared across labs. And so if you have these sort of organizations where it's like um, a like a, a computing core or something and their job is to, and they have staff whose job it is to help people who come to them from across that wider university or institution to, to do technical things, that's a really natural fit for the carpentries. But if everything is sort of compartmentalized and everyone's doing their own thing, it, it's hard to find someone to talk to. <laughs> so that's something we struggle with. Like, I, I can't think of an organization like RADC in, in Japan, but I don't, of course, I don't know the detail so much of what you do, but it, it seems to me that we don't have that sort of thing as much, unfortunately. Thanks, Joel. Um, Murray, you have your hand. Um, I, I say that I totally agree as well. Um, I think, so we've kind of lived in it and through it where I am um, at University of Otago. So one of the key things I think is you have the grassroots community grow, but it's also really important to have a high level champion. So somebody that is high enough up the food chain that they can get the resources and they can like start bringing it in at that top down approach. Um, and I think some of the strategies that's been around is to try and get it more embedded and it seems to be the libraries is almost the natural spot where people try and get the carpentries. Um, it's a support, or there's generally a lot of support. It's a place, a central place um, within university campuses, at least. Um, I mean, where I am, we were sort of grassrootsy. We had a lot of instructors. Um, we exported one to Japan. Um, and now the carpentries' responsibility, I suppose, followed me into my new role um, where it is managed from a centrally funded allocation. So at, at my institution it is. Nationally, um, like NESI, so the National E-Science Infrastructure, infrastructure um, has been pretty critical in trying to get 
other institutions on board. So they're similar, I suppose, to the ARDC model, but we're still looking at individual memberships um, and different institutions get different amounts of benefit from them. And so at one of our problems is working out how to best tease that out so that we can grow a massive community in New Zealand. Yeah, that's a great point about um, using libraries as a sort of a hub or a starting point. Uh, I, I have seen, I think, active carbon trees organizations based out of university libraries also. I think maybe it was Stanford, um, I want to say. Uh, so that that's certainly something to think about. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of curious, and I don't know if those that are representing various subcommunities know the history of this, but even to identify a champion, it seems that champion needs to have been exposed to the carpentries in some way. Like there was a workshop that they were invited to attend, or maybe they were at a conference where there was a workshop or, or something like that. But I'm, I'm wondering about um, kind of uh, back to your um, presentation again, Joel, where you were like, it, you know, how how do you sell something that no one knows, <laughs> no one knows anything about? And so, does anyone have um, any, you know, understanding of the history of how their um, sub communities have kind of grown from that seed at the very very beginning um, to get those champions and and get things started? I'm Christy. So I'm not 100% sure about like where the UCSB started from, but I think when our, um, I got hired around 2019, but we got a new university library and I wanna say like my senior year when I was at UCSB. Um, and she had brought the car, she had heard about the carpentries and then told my boss to do it. <laughs> so we were just kind of like, sort of directed to start and then he's not here but like that's what I think happened and then he was directed to you know like start with a carpentry workshop but we started with inviting faculty not students so the test run was with the faculty members and once they kind of got on board then like they were pushing they started pushing their students towards the carpentries and now we hold like four or five workshops per quarter Great, thanks so much, Christy. I, I am curious though, to kind of relate it again to um, some of the comments that have been made in that like in Japan, you currently don't have any member organizations. Do people feel that the having a member organization is key to be successful or not having because we have a lot of community members that aren't necessarily affiliated with a membership. And so I'm just wondering if from your perspective for, for a community to be sustainable, um, to have the resources it needs, do you think that that is something that um, is kind of a requirement? Honestly, I don't know. And um, that's a great point. Um, I think what we do, what I do feel the need for is just some degree of institutional support and oh, and sort of, I don't wanna say like approval necessary, but like, yeah, if it's something that you're doing, which is sort of outside of your standard job, um, you need to have at least some degree of understanding from like your boss or whoever is like signing you off to do this sort of thing. And um, like, and like I have a, a, a so I have a, a son, a young son, and uh, I can't just, it's not easy for me to say to like do a workshop on a weekend necessarily. Um, so, you know, having, yeah, some degree of understanding with your institution, I think is really important. And, and um, also for making resources available for, for holding workshops, of course, if you're gonna do it in person and for getting the word out, et cetera. So, um, it's, it's hard for me to say if it's, it's you know, positively one way or the other, uh, having not done it. <laughs> but I think we do need some degree of institutional support. And I would assume that becoming a member organization would, would definitely help with that. 
And of course, we need more instructors, right? So <laughs> we can't teach workshops without instructors. So I have an opinion about that. Um, we are the larger member organization in Santa Barbara, and um, our campus has a data science initiative, which also includes, I think, um, other smaller universities around like um, the Central Coast. So, mo so um, starting this summer, I think like we've opened our workshops, not just to UCSB students, but also other um, smaller universities around Santa Barbara. So one of our instructors that's helping us is from Westmont. So he's bringing the Westmont students to us. And I believe we're also bringing in the, com the community college people from SBCC as well. So I think for them, like it, it's, it's good for them because they don't have an institutional or organization, but they do team up with like a larger regional university and we're, we've been totally cool with that. Because I don't think like um, just that one, the one sole instructor from Westmont would have been able to get like the helpers perhaps. And also like, um, like organizing one workshop is, is a lot of work. Um, we've kind of streamlined our process and figured it out. But I think like if you're doing this alone, it's gonna be really hard. Um, I think, Joel, I'm also in the Japan Carpentry Slack, and I think there was like an inquiry from a professor. I'm not sure from where who asked like, oh, hey, like how would I start my own workshop? And there was like this giant, like sort of like, oh yeah, by the way, this is what we do. And maybe like we scared him a little bit. I'm not sure. Um, I wanted to just jump in um, to draw attention to the link I put in the chat for the National Institute of Informatics in um, Japan. And they are, uh, working to provide um, data management infrastructure on a national scale, which is just phenomenal. And perhaps there's an opportunity there to um, make some connections where um, you may be able to reach out through them and to some librarian groups. Um, but again, it's uh, I guess what I've learned with the community, regional community organising, it it takes a long time. You have to give people time to find their feet as well. Um, and in that, um, uh, speaking to your um, thoughts on burnout, uh, you you really need the you need to have the um, uh, never. We say never teach alone, but also never host alone, or don't try and host and teach at the same time because um, you'll just go crazy. Um, in fact, I'm setting myself crazy trying to do sort of that on the trainer level. Um, and it's uh, an interesting time. Something else, and I don't, I, I, I've heard you mention this, Joel, and again, I don't know um, about what might have um, uh, in terms of funding for some of the efforts in New Zealand or Australia, but um, I'm wondering if there's opportunities to find funding because that's another way to get folks to listen <laughs> is I got funding for this really great program and I'd like to bring it here to do X, Y, and Z. Um, uh, I know that in some of my previous work, it, not necessarily with the carpentries, but um, that's some of the ways I've been able to move some things that I really cared about, but I couldn't get the attention of the people that I was working with. They didn't think it was an important thing, um, but uh, identifying where those funding sources are. Um, and uh, once Carpentry Con is over, I feel like I'll have a little bit more time and space to think through some things, but that's something I'd be interested um, in exploring um, with all of you. If, if there are some funding opportunities, I, I could see that as our role in helping, um, um, you know, pursue those opportunities and um, bring them to the various sub-communities that could use, use those funds to help, um, you know, build momentum and get things kind of up and running. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be really helpful. Um, and we we have not made any headway with it, but we've discussed a little bit about possible funding sources and, um, but yeah, I haven't actually been able to apply to anything yet, um, but I think that would be helpful for sure. But even having some language you know, we all could share to put into various proposal opportunities, things like that. But um, yeah, uh, again, um, just 
wanted to just say it broadly to anyone, um, if there are those opportunities, um, I'm more than happy to help support pulling stuff together. Um, just, yeah, just, I guess, let us know. But I'll keep my eye out as well, for sure. I have a question to go back to the, um, uh, the, the prospect of Slack um, and their business model changes. Um, what alternatives are you thinking of at the moment, Joel, and what, um, what kinds of suggestions have people been offering you? How, where do you think that um, the um, community in Japan is going, Carpentry's community in Japan is going to head towards? So we haven't identified a um, ideal solution just yet, but there are um, a couple different, um, basically by Googling, I just figured out that there are a couple different like open source alternatives to Slack. And then there's also this thing called Matrix that I'm not very well versed with, but um, I know that Carpentry's Slack is connected to it. And it sort of, it seems to be a way to have an interface between different um, sort of chat platforms, I guess. Um, so apparently there's um, so, some ways to to make things work there. I think one of them I'm trying to find, uh, yeah, there's one called Elements. And I think they also have that it can connect versus via this matrix thing. <laughs> and um, basically you can have like an open source version of Slack. Uh, it looks like the downside of that is that they can't import um, private uh, messages. So you will probably lose those. Um, so at the moment, that's like, I think what is looking like we will probably do. Uh, the other thing is um, I, I did ask uh, in the Carpentry Slack if there's any possibilities about community. Uh, so like grants to help communities from the Carpentries, not from an outside source, uh, and was told that that may be something that could be coming uh, soon down the road. Um, and if that sort of um, thing was possible, then maybe we could just pay for Slack, which would be really helpful for our, our community. But we don't have any money right now to do that. <laughs> we, we are running on a zero, uh, yeah, figure budget. <laughs> I wanted to let you all know, I put something into the help desk and everything about Slack. <laughs> um, so uh, um, about, sorry, not Slack, about the etherpad um, being down. So just wanted to let you all know that, but, um, but yeah, so um, I don't know if if any of you were able to attend the welcome, the conference welcome um, that we had uh, to get you know things going um, this week. But um, we talked a little bit about our new accessibility fund. Um, we're um, trying to basically um, you know uh, start building funds to make things more accessible to our community. Um, and when we're thinking about accessibility, looking at that pretty broadly, um, but uh, that might be, you know, um, those types of services may be something that we can ultimately help support too through those types of funds. Um, but I, I do think it's worth exploring some of those open source options and seeing what um, what would what would potentially work well. But then again, you lose that knowledge that you had, you know, all of those conversations that you've had previously, which is um, which is a pretty significant loss for sure. Yeah, and I'm sure this change is going to impact many organizations who have been relying on on free slack so we're not the only ones for sure yeah oh it's a good um uh evaluation step to make as well um if it um if those conversations are important um and from from what perspective you might want to share them maybe getting in contact with your local um uh, uh um, is it collecting library um, who, if, if there's an institution like say a GLAM institution who's responsible, who seeks to um, preserve uh, digital community networking uh, evidence, they, they may have a remit to host a, an archive of, of that Slack to date. Um, 
I don't know if that'll go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and another option would be to mm -hmm. have um, use a, a community or a channel within the broader Carpentries um, workspace. Mm -hmm. But the problem there is we have many different channels that we use to organize our discussions and we do a lot of different things, translation to workshops. So it's kind of difficult to funnel that all into just one channel. Yeah. In fact, that's that's actually, we started out on a different Slack with the in the Tokyo R or Japan R Slack. I had one channel and we decided that wasn't enough. So that's what we had our own and then this happened. Yeah. Um, Liz, have you been in contact with anybody at the NII in Japan personally, or did you just know about their activities generally? No, um, I've been in contact with a couple of people. We had some. Um, uh, some meetings earlier this year talking about DMP, data management planning infrastructure. Um, and um, I've met um, uh, Masu, um, this guy Masu, who's come over to the uh, eResearch Australasia conference, which happens annually um, over here in October uh, a couple of times. He's been the main, I suppose, um, representative that I've spoken to um, at NII. So it might be worth me putting you in contact. That would be you. great. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> oh. um, I, I should ask what kind of with your, from what I know about your translation efforts, most of these are focused on the um, on software and data carpentry. Is that right? And would you, are you primarily focusing on a researcher audience or interested in the librarian um, research support crossover as well? So we have a couple members who are librarians and are very interested in translating library materials. Um, mm -hmm. But our founding member, Tom, uh, started with a focus on software carpentry and so, and, and more researcher focus. So that's kind of what we started with. Um, and we, we have often had the discussion of like, well, what should we translate next? And a lot of people have different interests and we all and we would love each love to like do a different lesson but we really need to focus our efforts on just getting one thing done i think at a time otherwise we won't finish any of it right so um yeah that's kind of how it's been going but actually the library lessons are a high priority because there's members who are interested in, in translating those mm -hmm. um so what would be probably useful is to get in contact with the library carpentry advisory group and see if they would like to be part of that advisory group or um, which has an interest in reaching out to Carpentries communities uh, beyond North America. Okay, I didn't know about that group. Ooh, Library. yeah, where um, we've been in holding pattern while <laughs> I've been, um, while I've been a co-chair holding the seat. Um, and when I remember to do things, um, it happens. Uh, library. I'll send I just you realize I keep not muting myself when I've been typing, so I apologize. Oh, it's fine. I, I think notice. I've been reversing how I was thinking about <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been hearing you at all, Alicia. It's totally fine. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, well, look, I'm looking for people to replace me on that advisory group. So <laughs> um, then again, uh, that's, I think that's another one of these uh, issues for community um, coordination. You don't necessarily want to dump someone in a community organization role if, you know, they're on their own or you don't want to drop them in the middle of the ocean. You want to drop them sort of somewhere near an island or near a collection of um, communities where they can they can do something and they don't necessarily have to swim for miles to to start creating community. You have a lot of work ahead for getting all of this stuff together for everyone. So I know it's highly needed. 
we're we're getting there. It's going slow, but we're getting there. Yeah, and ultimately, I think everybody values the um, appreciates the value of doing one thing at a time, and uh, we can. That is a great way of being kind to ourselves by <laughs> saying no to all of the possibilities, uh, which breaks my heart. I'm sorry. <laughs> We had some conversations early on about, you know, thinking about governance and even just that, you know, transition of who's serving in various roles. And I, um, I served as a um, lead of a volunteer program um, for the state of Virginia for a period of years, years and the governance for there, the volunteers, they had like a past, there were three presidents that kind of served at the same time for their governance. There was a past president, the current sitting president, and then president elect, so that the person who had previously served in the president role was helping support the current president and then the president elect was learning from that process. And so it was a really great way to kind of ease into um, some of those, um, you know, some of the roles that they were they were doing. I thought that was a really interesting way to do it. But um, again, I, I think what is such a challenge for our sub communities and the carpentries is that we're also different. Um, so there's no one size fits all and what's going to work in one place may not work somewhere else. And so um, what's the best way for us to build something that no matter where you are and what your specific needs are, there's something available to you to get you what you need so you can move things forward effectively. Um, so. Are there any other questions or comments? I think this has been a great conversation, even with such a small group. I've, I've learned a lot from um, uh, hearing from all of you. Um, and there's some great, great questions. And I think a lot of things to kind of think about and um, figure yeah. out in terms of how we can support some of these challenges that you've, the, that you've all um, brought forward. I want to emphasize um, uh, we had the first um, panel to talk about translations of Carpentry's resources. Um, it was yesterday for me. I'm not sure what day it was for, for everyone else. <laughs> um, but we are going to have kind of a second round of that. Um, and so if you are interested in learning um, more about what's been happening in that space, I encourage you um, uh, to um, check out um, that session. Joel's going to be a panelist um, on, on um, that as well. So um, it's been having some great conversations. And again, I think providing a lot of insights so that we kind of had a, a path forward and thinking about how to support all of you. Anything else? I don't want to keep us, but I, we have this space for another 14 minutes. So I've got a question for the wider audience, I suppose. Um, how many people are using the centrally organized workshops versus self-hosting or self-organized? Uh, yeah, well, that's easy for our, our one workshop was self-organized. <laughs> we don't have any central organization that we can go to. So. We haven't, haven't used them yet but um the centrally organized workshops were never really part of our uh, our our promise um so um e even though it, it might it might be a good idea for the partnership to engage with and use the centrally organized workshops as a starting off point as a springboard for self-organized workshops uh the I mean, what really needs to happen is the um, the local community uh, institutions to build their um, capacity for self-organized wor workshops. And um, so we don't know whether centrally organized workshops are necessarily going to fill that gap or not. Hi, I'm, I'm Noel from um, University of Auckland. Um, so we've I, I think, yeah, for the time that we've been, I've been here, um, we've always been self-organized. Um, but we have asked um, 
Nessie for um, their exp or some of their folks' time um, on teaching some of the workshops. Um, so we do get help from, um, I guess, our central um, organization. Thanks, Noel. Um, I, I will say centrally organized workshops, there has been a challenge um, since the pandemic in terms of finding instructors um, um, to, to support those workshops. And I don't know um, uh, if every, it sounds like everyone knows the distinction between them, but the centrally organized workshops, all the logistics and everything are handled by members of the core team. And then the core team um, finds the instructors to teach the workshops that are um, basically uh, requested by a host organization or institution um, for those workshops. Yeah, that's funny because we, I, for as long as I've been involved, we've been um, self-organized across, I think maybe we've had one or two somewhat centrally organized. Um, I say somewhat, they've been Nessie um, largely led into a different organization within New Zealand, um, but pretty much every workshop since 2015 at least in New Zealand has been self-organized so I just wondered how much that feature is being used within the Oceania community. Yeah I think one of the challenges too has been the incentives that used to be there for instructors because you know being able to travel somewhere new or to be able to network um, with folks in different areas of the world was um, you know yeah, a major incentive. And so um, transitioning online that that has kind of, you know, changed that dynamic um, quite significantly. Um, but I, I know that that's something that the Instructor Development Committee, um, which is um, volunteer um, uh, led, um, has been discussing over the past several months with the workshop administration team. So But from my from my understanding, um, it seems that most member organizations are doing the self organized workshops, um, for sure. Now, one thing that only just occurs to me now, as we're wrapping up, is that it probably would be more useful, or would be quite useful um, for the like our our secondary members, I guess, for our partnership. Um, for the carpentries to even um, run little trainings for um, how to organize, how to host a workshop. So it's a way of bringing in those hosts and the administrative staff to say, okay, well, this is how we do it in the carpentry style. And this is how we look after our instructors. And this is how here, here is all the evidence-based practice and how we've been doing things for years. Uh, and um, for for new people to do, and that is probably a, a better value proposition for uh, memberships too. So um, yeah, shoot that through to the core team um, by any means you can if you have the volition, Alicia. <laughs> I definitely will. And Omar is on the call too. I'm sure he's listening as well. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree that maybe having some more resources about um, messaging that we can convey to institutions um, where we're trying to set up workshops um, in sort of like easily digestible bits that are designed for people who have zero familiar with the carpentries um, would be helpful. Ah, uh, yes. Um, there are some resources, um, some one-pager resources on the advisory group um, GitHub repo um, that are designed for different levels. So one is a one-pager designed at the library director level and another is designed at the sort of librarian level um, with, you know, here's what you can take to your supervisor or here's what you can, um, here is what you can take to your director 
um, to help champion your cause. So is that specific to library carpentries though? Yeah, yeah, it's specific. So you probably, you might want to tweak some of it mm -hmm. um, for the other, other two. I'll see if I can find a link. Chris, to you and Amina, did you have a comment? Um, I think with Noel's comment about self-organized <gasps> workshops, usually when, because we've closed our Amy to institutional only, sometimes it's not listed um, on the main page, but sometimes we find people have found the workshop anyway. So as long as they show up on the wait list a day of, um, our general rule is, um, is um, if anyone comes on the wait list and there's space in the Zoom workshop, we'll, we'll let them in. And I know like the people who registered, they're not all gonna come. And also waitlisted folks, if they really wanna come, they'll show up at 9.30 in the morning. I uh, just wanted to bring the attention that um, there was a question for Joel yeah. in the chat. Uh, have you encountered any culturally specific language or references in the material that's hard to translate? Um, I would say not so much so far. Um, the The hardest thing that's been culturally different is is difficult, or the the biggest cultural uh, difficulty we've had is just the concept of the carpentries and what it does in the first place, uh, and sort of um, the idea of fostering fostering a community of practice. Uh, that idea is is pretty new for people. So it, it, that's been the, the biggest sticking point, I would say. Um, but as far as the actual content goes, I mean, almost all of the content is available online in Japanese somewhere anyways. Um, so if you have trouble with translating something, you just Google it until you find it, you know? Um, so it, it's, it's out there and people use these technical concepts, of course. So that's not such a big problem, I would say. Yeah, the Dracula and Wolfman, um, there, there's equivalence. I mean, we don't say Dracula and Wolfman. We have translations, but um, yeah, there's a, appropriate things we can use. And of course, that is part of translation is, um, a, 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 you know, translation is not just literally switching strings. We have to take into account local context. And it's so it's localization and, and not just pure translation. Um, but I think if, if it's done that way, then it's entirely possible. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be a good one to use. Thanks. <laughs> well, I think we're coming um, to the end of our um, session. Um, I wanted to thank the panelists again um, for uh, presenting today. Um, I, I definitely learned a lot. And there is going to be another panel of regional coordinators um, from Europe and Africa. That panel, I think, is in two days, I believe. Um, but um, I don't want to get anything wrong. So please, um, please go to the schedule on the website and you'll find um, when that's going to be happening. But I'm sure that that's going to be a great conversation as well. It's going to be led very similarly to this panel, um, just to hear from um, some of the different uh, regional sub communities and kind of what um, what they've been doing and some of the challenges that they've been facing. So um, yeah, be sure to check that out. And um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you all again. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day or evening or wherever you are in the world. Um, yeah. Well, thank I will you, stop Alicia, the recording for now. hosting and, and organizing and all the other panelists.